we now turn to a new topic, linear transformation. So far, what we've done is we've studied the problem AX equals B. That is, we started with A and B, and we tried to solve for X. If we turn this around and we start with A and X instead, then what we have is a function that transforms a vector X into a resulting vector Y. That is, Y is equal to AX. If A is of size M by N, then x is in fn, and the output y is in fm, as before. If you look at an example over here, I have a 2 by 3 matrix A that's applied to a vector x, and of course for that multiplication to exist, x has to be in R3. So we start in 3 space, and we end up in 2 space. I have a vector with 2 entries as a result of applying A to that vector x. So our transformation A starts in 3 space and goes into 2 space. So, for example, if I plug in some x vector like 2, 0, minus 1, and I compute the output y is equal to ax, I get 1, 5, and I substitute. Here's a remark. If I write a function applied to some argument x, typically what we are writing is just f of x, where we denote the argument that the function f is applied to with parentheses, f, open paren, x, close paren. With our matrix notation, the parentheses is omitted. So we have y is equal to a times x, and we can think of a as an operation that is performed on x. We don't necessarily have to have a matrix applied to some vector x. We could have something more general. So here I've given three examples. This time I'm going to use capital T for the transformation operation that I'm going to apply to my vector x. And my first example is that operation applied to the vector x simply takes x and adds a constant vector to it. T of x1, x2, for example, would be x1, x2 plus the vector 1, 2 moves the x vector by that constant vector 1, 2. My second example has an x vector with three variables and t applied to that x vector. Well, I'm going to construct a four vector out of it, but I'm going to have the first entry will depend on x1, x2. The last entry depends on x1, x2, constants in between. And x3, as you see, simply is not involved in that transformation. X3 does not appear on the right-hand side. So, for example, if I apply t to the vector 5, 4, 9, I get 5 plus 4, 9, 5 minus 4, that's 1 for the last entry. And the entry 9 that I had in my vector doesn't enter this computer. My last example is t applied to a vector x. Again, I start in 3 space and end up in 2 space. But this time around, the first entry is a product of x1 and x2. And if I try and write that as a matrix, I find I can't. The only way that the entries of that vector x can appear if I have a times x is as a linear combination of the x's, not products. As an example of what happens with a vector here, if I plug in 5, 4, 9, I get the vector, well, 5 times 4 is 20, and last entry 9. Some remark on that notation again. We are still writing t applied to x without parentheses. And uh, sometimes you'll encounter function notation as well, where we say that t is a function of x1, x2, x3, and it's giving me a set of two outputs, x1, x2, and x3. And what we'll do is we'll immediately rewrite that in vector form. This is the same as my third example above. I can think of a function f of x as being a transformation that takes a vector x to a vector with entry f of x, and my vectors have size 1 in both cases. So functions I can think of as transformations on vectors as well. One more thing about this notation that sometimes confuses students when they first encounter it. The Parenthesis in this expression here actually denotes the vector. So t is applied to a vector. And here the entries in t, x1 and x2, you can think of as slots. Whatever appears in my vector as the first entry, 
it appears in the output as the first entry times whatever is in the second slot, whatever is in X2. And similarly, the second entry here is whatever is in the second slot, quantity squared. So for example, if I take a vector that has a more complicated expression for its first entry, u1 squared plus v1, and the second entry u2 plus 3, then my recipe says to multiply those two entries together to get the first entry of the output. So it's u1 squared plus v1 quantity times u2 plus 3. Similarly, the second entry we were told to square then becomes u2 plus 3 quantity squared on the output. Now that we have this notion of transformation for a matrix, let's talk about possible geometric representations. I'll start with a couple of examples. So for instance, I have a transformation that goes from R2 into R2. Y1, Y2 is equal to this matrix 1, 1, 0, 1 applied to my X vector. And so if I were to apply that to the point 2, 3, I'd get the point 5, 3 out of it. So over here, since the input and output are both in 2D, I can draw them on the same set of axes. I start with my x vector in blue, that's the vector 2, 3. And when I compute t applied to that x vector, I get my red vector, y, equal to 5, 3. The transformation changed the blue vector x into the red vector y. As my second example, if I think of an image, images are actually arrays of points. So each point in this image here is a pixel value. So I have an image made up of lots and lots and lots of points in this representation, and I can apply a transformation to each one of those points. So for example, if I take the transformation x1, x2, any one location in that image, what we'll do is apply the matrix minus 1, 0, 0, 1 to it, what that will do is it will take x1 to minus x1 and keep x2 the same. For images, the first axis actually runs from the top to the bottom. So when I apply this transformation to this image of a cat here, what it's going to do is it's going to flip the x-axis around. The positive values become negative values. And when I plot on my separate axis, what I see is the cat turned upside down. Okay, we use two different sets of axes. The domain of our function, the x1 and x2 values, are on my first set of axes, this cat right side up. And my output of my function, the codomain, is again a two-dimensional space. And this time around, the range is my cat turned upside down. My third example is going to illustrate some concepts that we will discuss next. So, my matrix transformation is the matrix 0, 2, 0, 1 applied to a vector x. And when I compute the output of that transformation, I get x2 times the constant vector 2, 1. And so my output is going to be on the line y is equal to alpha times 2, 1, the red line in my graphical representation on the right hand side. So I have this geometric interpretation of what this matrix does, is it's going to project onto that red line keeping the y value constant. Some basic concepts are, on the one hand, the domain. The domain is all of the inputs that I can put into my function. And in this particular case, the domain is R2. Any x vector in R2, I can compute that function with. So my domain is R2. And the codomain, where I end up, well, I end up with a vector in R2 again. So my codomain is also R2. The range, however, is not all of R2. The range of the function, if I substitute all possible x values in this transformation, the range of my function is this red line. x2 can take on any value, and therefore it's any point on that red line is in the range. Now, there are two more concepts that will prove important for transformations. One of them is one-to-one. -one and the other one is onto. What one-to-one -one means is that if I take two different inputs, I have to get to two different outputs. And so the correct definition is if I look at some output, there's only one possible input value into my transformation Tx that will produce that output. That is, if I have Tx1 is equal to Tx2, meaning the same output, then 
necessarily x1 must equal x2. In my example up here, what I see is that if I focus on any one point on the red line, say the value 6, 2, I can get to that value 6, 2, of course, from point 1, 3, but also from any other point on that black line at the same height. They all map to the same output value. This example, therefore, is not one-to-one. -one. The other concept, onto, means that the codomain and the range are the same. In our example here, the codomain is R2, but the range is a line in R2. Any point that is away from that line, I cannot reach with that transformation. There is no x that will lead to that point. Therefore, this function is not onto as well. Now, a special case of transformations are linear transformation. What that means is patterned after matrix multiplication. If you look at the way matrix multiplication works, if I take two vectors, u and v, and I apply a matrix A to u and a matrix A to v, and I add, then the result is the same as if I first add u and v and then apply a to it. This first property, a applied to u plus v, that vector, is equal to a u plus a v. Similarly, if I scale a vector by some constant alpha, uh, then the matrix A applied to alpha u is the same as if I apply the matrix A to u and then scale by alpha. And what this means is that I can do my addition and my scaling in the domain, or I can do my addition and scaling in the codomain, and it won't make any difference. I can do that transformation on either side. So in general, with a general transformation T, we'll demand that the general transformation T satisfy these rules as well. So T applied to U plus V, I'm adding in my domain and then applying the transformation T to it, I get TU plus TV. Similarly, if I take TU and TV, now I'm in the codomain, if I add them, I'm getting the same output regardless. Similarly for alpha times u, again, I can apply it on either side of my transformation. So linear transformations are special in the sense that I can do that transformation either before or after vector addition and scalar multiplication. Here are two examples that go with that. Let's take two vectors, u and v, and I've already computed u plus v since I'm going to use it. And let's take an alpha that happens to be equal to 2. And now let's look at each of the following transformations. The first one, T1, is simply a matrix applied to my vector x, y, z. So I'm starting with a vector in R3, and my output is a vector in R2. And I'll recompute the outputs for the vector u, the vector v, the vector u plus v, and the vector 2u, which I both need in my example. So now we check. t1u plus t1v, that's 10, 6, that's equal to t1 applied to u plus v as well. So for this example, at least, we see that the linearity property holds. And similarly, for t1 applied to 2u, t1 applied to 2u is 6, 4. 2 times t1 applied to u is 6, 4. Again, the second property also holds. And of course, this is an example. An example by itself would not be sufficient to prove that the properties hold for all vectors. However, we do know that for a matrix, indeed, matrix multiplication times vector is a linear operation. So, no surprise. For my second example here, T2 applied to a vector x, y, z is, well, I have this product of x and y sitting in the first entry of the output. Therefore, I can't write that example as a matrix times the vector x, y, z. However, pre-computing that T2u is minus 4, 2, T2 applied to v is 12, 4, T2 applied to u plus v, we get 16, 6, and T2 applied to 2u, we find minus 16, 4. And now when we check our properties, T2 of u plus T2 of v is 8, 6. 
but T2 of U plus V is 16, 6. Those results are not the same, and therefore we have a counterexample. This transformation is not a linear transformation. There are vectors for which this property does not hold. Similarly, if I check the other property, T2 applied to 2U is minus 16, 4, but 2 times T2U is minus 8, 4. Again, the results are not the same, and therefore T2 is not a linear transformation based on that test as well. So we have a counterexample to the statement that T2 is linear, which means that this property would have to hold for all vectors u and v, and we have an example of a u to v and an alpha for which it does not hold. So here are some remarks. First, T1 was already known to be a linear transformation since matrix multiplication is known to be linear. Uh, providing one or more examples again, it works for these vectors, is not sufficient to establish the claim that a transformation is linear. However, providing a counterexample, saying it does not work for these vectors, that is sufficient to reject the claim. If I have a counterexample, then the transformation is not linear. Two further remarks that I want to make is that to show that the transformation T is linear, I have to establish both of these properties. I have to establish that T applied to U plus V is equal to TU plus TV, and I also have to establish that t applied to alpha u is equal to alpha t u for all possible vectors u and v and all possible scalars alpha. To prove that the transformation is not linear, well, if either one of those operations fails, that is sufficient to say the operation is not linear. So when I'm checking, the moment I have one of these fail, I can stop and immediately say that the transformation is not linear. Now here are some useful theorems for us to consider. The first one is that if I combine my two properties, if I simply write a linear combination of vectors, alpha 1 times a vector u1 plus alpha 2 times a vector u2 all the way to alpha n u n, and I apply the transformation t to it, if the transformation is linear, I get alpha 1 times t applied to u1 plus alpha 2 times t applied to u2. So what happens is that T distributes over the sum and distributes over scalar multiple. Here's an important example that derives from that. Suppose I have a vector U in Rn uh, with entries U1 through Un. I can always split it. I can always write it in the form U1 times the first column of I plus U2 times the second column of I plus Un times the last column of i, where i is the same size as my vector, namely n by n. Now, if I take that vector u and I apply a linear transformation t to it, then from the theorem that we just had, t just distributes. So t applied to u is u1 times t applied to the first column of i, plus u2 times t applied to the second column of i, t applied to the last column of i, that means that if I know what t does to each of the columns of i, then I know what this linear transformation does to an arbitrary vector u. It's just this linear combination. And this linear combination, I can recognize that that is just a matrix product. Overall, then, what happens is that if I call the columns of i, the first column, second column, third column, as e1, e2, all the way to en, and I compute t applied to each one of those vectors, let's call it e tilde i, whatever that output is, I'm going to have the linear combination of these e tildes. And writing that in matrix form, that simply takes the E1 tilde and writes it into a matrix as the first column, second column, third column. My transformation T is therefore represented by a matrix. That's so important, in fact, that we'll write it as a theorem. Here's my example. I have a transformation T that is known to be linear and that goes from R2 into R2. So I have to look at what happens to the columns of a 2 by 2 matrix I. So what T does to the vector 1, 0, let's say it's 2, 3, 
and what t does to the vector is 0, 1. Let's say it's 5, 1. And since I know that t is linear, I'll put these vectors into my matrix as the first column and second column, respectively. And my transformation, therefore, t applied to x is equal to this matrix times x. If the transformation is not linear, well, I could compute what t does to the columns of i. I could put them into a matrix just like that. But if I try and plug other x vectors into that matrix form of the equation, that will turn out not to be tx in general. So this only works for linear transformations. So it's going to be very important to figure out whether or not a transformation is linear or not. Because when it is linear, I can represent it simply by a matrix. That matrix has t applied to the first column of i, t applied to the second column of i, t applied to the last column of i as columns in our matrix representation. The next important theorem is that if I think of two linear transformations, let's look at the last line. So I start with an x, I transform it with an s to get that intermediate value y tilde, and then I apply t to get my final value y. And s and t are linear. Then this combination is also a linear transformation, namely y is equal to, look at how the order goes. I start with the x, I apply s to it, so sx, and then I take that output, so my parenthesis here simply groups the sx, and I apply t to the output. So it's t applied to sx, the opposite of the order in which we normally think whatever is closer to x gets applied before a later transformation to the left. Now, we normally omit the grouping parenthesis. Instead of writing t applied to s applied to x, we will simply write t s x. Here is an example. Let's look at the transformation s applied to x as this matrix 1, 2, 4, 1 applied to x. And then similarly, a transformation t applied to some vector, let's call it y tilde, as before, uh, implemented by this matrix 3, 0, 1, 1 applied to y tilde. And I'm now looking at the transformation that starts with an x, applies s to it, gets me a tilde y, applies t to that, and gets me a y. And so my total linear transformation is t applied to s applied to x, and therefore the matrix representation for t times the matrix representation for s times x. But matrix multiplications I can group, and so I'll group them together, and multiply this out, and I get the overall linear transformation as the product of the individual transformations in that particular order. Remember, matrix multiplication doesn't commute. If I change the order, in general, I get a different matrix. I'll get a different linear transformation. S followed by T is not the same as T followed by S. The other concepts that we had were one to one onto. And we know that linear transformations can be implemented as matrices y is equal to ax. And now let's think through the one to one transformation in terms of what we know about that matrix. We're applying a matrix A to x. So a one to one transformation requires that if I have some output y, that I can't reach it from more than one input x. Let me fix that a y. Let me call it b. So I have the matrix equation a x equals b, and I'm saying that there's only one x that satisfies that equation, but that says that a x equals b has to have a unique solution. That means that a can't have any free variables. And therefore, a linear transformation of y equals ax is 1 to 1 if a row echelon form of a has a pivot in every column, no free variables, and only if that is the case. An onto transformation, let's see, the definition of onto means that the codomain is the same as the range. So if I look at some output of ax, call it b again, what we are saying is that ax equals b, if I look at that equation here, that equation 
has to be satisfied for any possible b, for all possible b's in my codomain. But that means that ax equals b, that I can't have any contradictions, because the moment I have a row of zeros in a row echelon form of a, I know that there are vectors b that I cannot reach. So no contradictions allowed. No rows of zeros in a row echelon form of a. Therefore, a linear transformation y equals ax is onto if and only if a row echelon form from a has a pivot in every row. And therefore, let's write that down as a theorem. Namely, I'm starting with a matrix A of size m by n, and I'm looking at the linear transformation y equals ax. Start with the matrix, so I know it's linear. Then that linear transformation is one to one, if I find a pivot in every column of A, that linear transformation is onto if I find a pivot in every row of the row echelon form of A. Now, don't memorize this theorem. Don't simply memorize one to one means pivot in every column, because after three days, you won't get it right. And on the exam, I usually see half the students get those two conditions mixed up learn how to think through those arguments that we just gave for why we conclude that one-to-one -one means pivot in every column and onto means pivot in every row. That will stay with you. The last theorem that I want to pull out is that a zero vector will transform into the zero vector when I have a linear transformation. So from what you've said, linear transformations can be represented as matrices. If the equation is not linear, I can't represent it as a matrix. So what we want to do is we want to figure out whether or not the transformation we're given is actually linear. So how do we check? Well, the test is I have two properties. I've got T applied to U plus V is equal to TU plus TV. And I have T applied to alpha U is equal to alpha times TU. And that must be satisfied for any two vectors U and V and any scalar alpha. So we have to make sure that we check these for all possible vectors u and v and all possible alpha. So what I have to do, therefore, is the following. I'm going to try and check these two properties. And if either one of them fails, then I know that t is not a linear transformation. If both of them hold, however, then t is a linear transformation. And again, I want to emphasize that if you try and show that T is linear, just giving a couple of example vectors and scalars that say those example vectors indeed satisfy T applied to U plus V is equal to T U plus T V, and T applied to alpha U indeed sat T of alpha U is equal to alpha T U. That isn't good enough. It has to hold for every vector and every scalar, not just some such. Let's see how this is done. Uh, the first example will prove to be linear, but let's start out with my transformation. Here it is. T goes from a vector x, y, z to a vector x plus 2, y, 3, x plus z. And now I want to check whether or not T is linear. The very first thing I'll do is to simply figure out the sizes of my vectors. My T starts with a vector in R3 and ends up with a vector in R2. So I know what my input vectors are. They are in R3, and I have to show it for all input vectors. So I have to show general vectors in R3. So I'm going to set up general vectors in R3. U, with enters U1, U2, U3, unspecified, so there are parameters that can take on any value and therefore be any vector. Similarly for V, and then I'll need U plus V and alpha U, so I'll simply pre-compute them, u plus v is the sum of the entries, and alpha u is just alpha times the entries. And once I have this general u, I'll also pick a general scalar alpha that I'll leave as a parameter. And now I'm set up as any two vectors u and v and any scalar alpha. Now I'm going to have to verify each of the two properties for these vectors. First check we'll do is whether or not t applied to the general vectors u plus v is equal to t applied to u plus t applied to v. I won't keep it quite in this form to make my computations easy. I'll pull everything to the same size. So I want to check that t applied to u plus v minus tu minus tv is equal to zero. 
So let's set that up. T applied to u plus v minus tu minus tv. If it's linear, it should come out as zero. If it's not linear, well, we'll see. Since I don't know what the output is going to be, I'll simply give it a name, I'll call it xi, and now I can write a nice sentence, xi is equal to this expression, which I then substitute, which I substitute, simplify, 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 and eventually I want to come out with zero, zero if it's linear. So let's see how this goes. T applied to u plus v, I had already pre-computed it, so T applied to the u plus v vector, minus T applied to the u vector, minus T applied to the v vector. So next I have to transform, so I have to remember what my transformation t was. Well, the first entry is whatever is in the first slot plus two times the second slot. So whatever is in the first slot, that was u1 plus v1, plus two times whatever is in the second slot, that's u2 plus v2. And then in the second entry, I'm going to get three times the first slot plus the third slot, three times u1 plus v1 plus u3 plus v3. That's t applied to u plus v. Then I want to subtract off t applied to u. And again, first slot, second slot, first slot plus two times the second slot, that's the first entry, and three times the first slot plus the third slot, that's the second entry. And finally, t applied to v in exactly the same way, so now I have v vectors that I have to simplify. Pulling all of the entries together into a single vector, this is the expression I get. And now if I check, uh, u1 cancels with minus u1, v1 cancels with minus v1, 2u2 with minus 2u2, and 2v2 with minus 2v2. So when I simplify all of these expressions, I indeed get the zero vector out of it. So t of u plus v is equal to tu plus tv for all vectors u and v. We didn't specify what those vectors were. We had them parameterized. They could be any vectors and this expression will hold for whichever vector we choose. We'll do exactly the same thing for the second property. Instead of trying to compute that t alpha u is equal to alpha t u, we'll pull the alpha t u to the other side and simply say t of alpha u minus alpha t u. And when we plug in and simplify, does that add up to zero? So we'll give it a name, we'll call it zeta, and again write our equalities as we go. And when I plug in now, in exactly the same fashion, I get t on the vector alpha u that I pre-computed minus alpha times t u. And now I apply t as before, combine everything into a single vector and simplify as much as I can. And again, I end up with the zero vector. So again, my property holds for all vectors u and all scalars alpha. Since both of these properties hold for all possible vectors and all alphas, I'll write down my conclusion. That, that transformation t, therefore, is a linear transformation. Now it turns out that there was an easier way of doing this. If I look at my expression again, t applied to that vector x, y, z is equal to this result I look at it long enough, I might recognize that I can write that as a matrix times the vector x, y, z. Namely, I can simply rewrite this as the matrix 1, 2, 0 applied to x, y, z, multiplied out, it's x plus 2y plus 0, x plus 2y, that's my first entry, and 3, 0, 1 multiplies out to 3x plus z, that's my second entry. So t applied to this vector x, y, z is actually a matrix applied to x, y, z. And we have a theorem from matrix multiplication that that is linear. Therefore, t is a linear transformation. So when I have to do a computation like this, when I have to check whether or not t is a linear transformation, the very first thing I do is to simply check, can I write it as a matrix? Because if I can, I'm done. If not, I have to go through a general method. Now let's look what happens when it fails. So we are going to look at a transformation that will turn out to be non-linear. Here's my example. T applied to, again, a vector in R3, ends up with this vector in R2, but now see these squares, x squared and z squared? I can't write that as a matrix. My observation that if I can write it as a matrix, unfortunately, it doesn't hold. And the result will be that, no, this won't be a linear transformation, since we already know that linear transformations we can write with a matrix. Again, we first know that we start from R3, 
and we end up in R2. So the general vectors that you have to write down are vectors in R3 again. Let's set them up. Have my vector u, my vector v, parameterized by u1 through u3 and v1 through v3. I'll pre-compute the sum, and I'll pre-compute alpha times that vector, where alpha is any scalar. So now I have two generic vectors, u and v, and a generic alpha. Now that we are ready, let's do our computation. And as before, let's start with the first condition that t distributes over the addition. So t of u plus v is equal to tu plus tv. And we proceed exactly as before. So we set up some unknown vector c and set it equal to tu plus v minus tu minus tv. And therefore plug in our vectors that we had already prepared. So x squared plus z squared, first slot plus third slot, each of them squared and added, minus t applied to u, first slot squared plus third slot squared, first slot minus third slot, and similarly for t applied to v. And now we try and simplify this expression. So we do the algebra, combine all the entries, and after everything is said and done, I end up with 2u1v1 plus 2u3v3 as the first entry of my result. Well, that doesn't look like zero. In fact, when something like that happens, it's good to produce a counterexample just to make sure. So I need vectors u and v such that this expression here is not zero. And well, an easy one might simply be to take u equal to v equal to 1, 0, 0. Because when I plug that in, I get 2 for the first entry, 2, 0. And checking that tu and tv, well, u was equal to v, computing them, that's 1, 1. And therefore, tu plus tv is the vector 2, 2. But if I compute t on the vector u plus v, on the vector 2, 0, 0, I get 4, 2. They're different vectors. And since they're different vectors, I conclude that t is not a linear transformation. Okay, so this property here has failed. If I'd started with the other property, I had to check that t of alpha u is equal to alpha t u. If I try that one, I see that whatever the output vector is, let's call it zeta, is equal to t applied to alpha u minus alpha t u, and we proceed as before. We plug in our prepared vectors, we apply t to them, and we get this expression over here. We simplify, and we end up with alpha times alpha minus 1 times u1 squared plus u3 squared as the first entry of the vector, not 0, 0. Looking at that expression, it doesn't look like 0. But again, let's try and produce a counterexample. So I have to pick an alpha and a u vector such that this expression in the first entry is not equal to 0. Now, if you think about it, alpha can't be 0 or 1, so let's pick alpha equals 2. And for u1 squared plus u3 squared non 0, let's just pick the vector 1, 0, 0 again. So let's compute tu. tu turns out to be 1, 1. And therefore, 2 times tu turns out to be 2, 2. But t applied to 2u to the vector 2, 0, 0 ends up at 4, 2. And again, those two vectors, those two results are not the same. t of 2 times u for this particular vector u and 2 times t of u are different. And therefore, again, this check also says that t is not a linear transformation. And therefore, when I have a transformation, I run these checks. If either one of them fails, I immediately stop and say that t is not a linear transformation. If both of them succeed, that is the only case under which I can conclude that t is a linear transformation. I'll have another example that, on first thought, seems a little bit surprising. Let's look at the equation of a line. So let's look at the function f of x is equal to ax plus b. And we already know that we can think of that as a linear transformation. Namely, I start with an entry x in R1, so a vector in R1. And I transform that into the vector ax plus b that's also in R1. So that line is actually a transformation. I can make it a little bit more general. I can say a transformation t applied to x could be some constant alpha times x plus a vector b. And therefore, alpha is a constant in R, and that vector b is whatever size vector we have for x, let's say rn. 
For alpha equals 1, this general transformation simply translates a point from x to x plus this constant vector. Now, when I try and figure out whether or not the transformation is linear, zeta is equal to tu plus v minus tu minus tv, and t of u plus v is alpha u plus v plus z vector b, then minus tu is minus alpha u minus b, minus tv is similarly minus alpha v minus So here is uh, that expression. And now I simplify, I end up with the vector minus b. So if that b vector is not zero, then that first property doesn't hold. That transformation is not linear. The equation of a line does not represent a linear transformation. So translating points in a plane, I can't write as a matrix. Well, there's a fix for it to turn. We can apply what mathematicians call embedding. We can try and make our problem bigger. Instead of using the vector x, we are going to go up by one dimension. We'll have one more entry in that x, and that's a transformation, of course, that we apply. There is a mapping I define from a vector x to a vector that has one more entry in it. And that last entry will set equal to 1. With this modified vector, the transformation can be expressed as a matrix. Alpha times i, fill in the vector b, and 0, 1. This matrix applied to the vector x1 turns out to be alpha x plus b, and still the extra entry 1 in it. I get my translation of that point x by a vector b represented by a matrix. Now, in computer graphics, we want to apply linear transformations to points in 3-space. And in particular, if I want a translation, I have to go from 3-space, therefore, to 4-space. I have to add that extra 1 to it. And 4-space, a matrix in 4-space, is 4 by 4. So what we do when we transform an image, a projection of a scene in 3-space, is we are going to have to apply matrices of size 4 by 4 to our points in the image. Lots of them. That matrix applied to each point in our space, and therefore graphics cards can apply 4 by 4 matrices to each one of these points at the same time, in parallel. And as a consequence of that, graphics cards turn out to be extremely good at doing matrix operations faster. Our takeaway for today, then. Linear transformations obey these two rules for any vector u and v and any scalar alpha. And we found that when we have linear transformations, we can always write them in terms of a matrix. If t is a matrix to begin with, we have a theorem that that is a linear transformation. If t isn't given in terms of a matrix, well, then we have to run our checks to verify whether or not that transformation satisfies both of these properties. But when it does, we can write down a matrix representation of the transformation. We can simply look at what t does to each one of the columns of i and put that into a matrix as columns, and then we have t x is equal to this matrix times x. The other important conclusion was that if I have linear transformations that I apply in sequence, so I start with an x, I apply an s, get an intermediate output, apply a t, and get my final output, that the overall transformation from x to y is also a linear transformation, that it has a matrix representation, namely the matrix representing t times the matrix representing s is the overall matrix representing that transformation. First apply s to x, then apply t to that output. And again, I want to emphasize, look at the order. I'm starting with the x. I'm applying the s transformation first. I have to multiply it in from the left. And now I've got my intermediate output. Again, I have to apply the T transformation by multiplying in my matrix from the left. So ATAS represents first do S, then do T. Now for linear transformation, we can write down a matrix that represents the transformation. For nonlinear transformations, we could write down the same matrix. However, it does not give the same results as the transformation times x for arbitrary vectors x. So 
we really need to prove that a transformation is linear in order to establish that the matrix T applied to the, each of the columns of I does indeed represent the transformation in matrix form. The other point that I can't stress enough is that proving that T is linear requires establishing both of those properties for every vector U and every vector V and every scalar alpha. Producing a counterexample to either one of these properties, this proves the claim that T is linear. Just showing a few examples is not sufficient to prove the claim that T is a linear transformation.